So first I'd like to sincerely thank you for the invitation to to speak. Um, it is truly a pleasure to be to be here with you to discuss um, to discuss my research. Um, my presentation today evolved out of my doctoral research. Um, since then, I have extended upon it, um, expanded upon some of the main central ideas, and compared it with several other. Um, or, or rather, I'm, I, I, my plan is to um, extend it to compare with other similar movements worldwide in a monograph entitled Ethnic Dignity, which I'm currently currently putting together. Um, so the research for this was conducted between 2014 and 2016, um, and it was conducted here in Northern Ireland, looking at the pol politics of Ulster Scots, but especially focusing on the rise of Ulster Scots um, education. In terms of my data, it included um, 42 semi-structured interviews, um, and this involved uh, 12 MLAs, interviews and focus groups with a variety of uh, members of staff from 12 different Ulster Scots flagship schools, uh, seven past and present staff members and associates at the Ulster Scots Agency, three central figures within the Ulster Scots Heritage Council, um, and a variety of other uh, key uh, individuals that I thought were um, interesting to speak to um, who are working in the Ulster Scots movement. Um, the research also included a in-depth documentary analysis of all currently available Ulster Scots um, teaching materials made available for teachers at the time of research. Um, the, uh, the, the booklets uh, for, for teaching were put together by the Ulster Scots Agency um, and made them also by um, a combination between the, the agency um, and Strand Mills. Um, the other piece of uh, data, the, which I'm not going to really use today, was a survey of 146 um, children aged 10 to 11 across eight different schools. Um, P, the reason for the, for the age choice is that P7 is the age which uh, were most targeted um, uh, for um, also Scots education in the schools in which it was being taught. I want to start by outlining my core um, argument. I contend that Ulster Scots is best understood alongside other folk revivals of historically dominant identities, um, including uh, Boer or Afrikaner identity movements in um, post-apartheid South Africa, um, Shinto revivalism in Japan, um, and white hyphenated identities um, in the US. I argue that in terms of content and, and, and utility, such movements can be best understood as representing a mechanism through which historically dominant groups can attempt to gain a sense of collective dignity. This dignity is sought in response to a sense of defeatism and humiliation, um, often felt from real or perceived um, erosions uh, to um, a sense of, um, of uh, um, heightened status, historically. Um, however, ethnic dignity tends to fail in these different, in these different um, uh, iterations, tends to fail to live up to or face up to um, the historic or present realities um, from which they, they emerge. Far from dealing with the past, such, tor t such discourses tend to, um, in fact, uh, occlude, obscure, occasionally perpetuate, and sometimes even create new forms of inequality um, and injustice. In building my argument, I draw on scholars of narrative and identity formation, especially Roger Smith, um, and his stories of peoplehood approach. <clears throat> Smith's work encourages a detailed analysis of the constitutive, political, and economic elements of stories told about peoples, including ethnic peoples, national, racial, political, and other forms of group identity. Um, I also very much align with critical race theory and writers in ethnic and racial studies uh, such as Bru uh, Rogers Brubaker, who call into question notions of ethnic groupness, um, viewing ethnicity rather as, as cognition rather than something real and biological and, and naturally occurring. <clears throat> 
so setting the scene, it's interesting giving this talk um, in the context of being in Belfast, as all of you have uh, a probably some some uh, relationship with Ulster Scots, um, some understanding of what Ulster Scots um, is. Very often around the world, if I'm discussing this with people, it is um, uh, the first question is what is Ulster Scots? Uh, if people often haven't heard of it. Um, However, the question, what is Ulster Scots, I think, in um, a Northern Irish context, is still one that needs to be answered, is still extremely fraught, extreme, extremely, uh, it's still extremely um, contentious. So I want to uh, briefly outline um, how I understand it. Ulster Scots is a folk revival movement, a movement which claims that a distinct ethnic group with a specific genealogy, history, culture, language and heritage Exist in, exists in Ulster, and Ulster in its nine-county form. This ethno-linguistic group alleges to trace its origins back to Scotland, where its language, culture, and biological idiosyncrasies originated. Ulster Scots really bursts onto the scene in the 1990s, initially in the form of being um, a language. Prior to the 1990s, it was almost essentially um, unheard of. Um, the earliest forms... Um, of the discourse were pro promoted by writers such as um, Ian Adamson in the 1970s um, through uh, what I would regard as quite an outlandish uh, reading of ancient history. Certainly prior to the, to the latter 20th century, nothing like a discourse of Ulster Scots as we would currently um, understand it existed. Um, from the 1990s, a concerted effort and its promotion was mounted by um, a group, um, a small group of um, unionist uh, political and cultural elites, um, and as the turn of the, the as the as the 1980s brought about the, the cultural turn in the in the troubles, the two communities diagnosis um, came to the fore, and it's in this context that a um, the, the the need for a cultural linguistic identity, which in some ways um, mirrors um, uh, the, uh, an Irish Catholic discourse uh, becomes uh, increasingly a, a political ne necessity. Um, for this, and actually a, a host of other reasons, despite uh, the relative novelty to, uh, of Ulster Scots to the public uh, discourse, it managed to move from relative obscurity, actually, to inclusion in, in the 1998 agreement um, in a relative sh re relatively short number of years in the public, um, in the public uh, discourse. To give some of the kind of broad descriptors from survey data, what we know, um, this is, according to the census, uh, the percentage of people in Northern Ireland who speak Ulster Scots, eight point, or who have some level of linguistic ability, now, it's discussed 8.08%. Um, comparing to Irish, Irish is 10.65%. Some of this is what you might expect um, because uh, um, uh, Ulster Scots is a much easier language to learn than, than Irish. Um, the next slide, I'm, I'm giving you an example of three different ways of um, saying, hello, um, how are you? The point of this is not to rubbish Ulster Scots um, uh, linguistically, it's just to show the, uh, that it's comparatively easier. Um, and these, these are from, uh, from websites which um, state translations of Ulster Scots. So, hello, how are you? Dear which can visit Tatu, Hiya, how's things? Or in maximally differentiated Ulster Scots, Farfaya, what fettle? Um, important to note that Ulster Scots as a language is not kind of, it's not set. There are lots of iterations. Um, there are some uh, interesting linguistic elements to Ulster Scots, which um, which do which can be traced back to um, the to spoken Scots in Scotland. Thran, uh, Thon, a Bannock, your Oxters, a Shoch, a wee Danner. Um, so there are some interesting in, uh, linguistic um, idiosyncrasies to it, um, but comparably much easier to learn um, than Irish. But then Irish has also been taught in in schools for much longer, Ulster Scots hasn't. Um, and we, when we break these statistics down, it tells us a more detailed picture. So Ulster Scots is much higher on understand only. 
Um, whereas if you go to the absolute opposite, opposite end, um, having all linguistic abilities, understand, speak, read, write, um, Irish is much higher than Ulster Scots. And if you look at it broken down um, according to this previous um, uh, graph, uh, you can see that actually some of the more straightforward things, being able to understand the language, being able to read the language, um, make up a high percentage of, of that summer building in Ulster Scots, whereas a much higher proportion <coughs> of Irish is, is um, uh, made up of those uh, more difficult things to learn, um, to be able to speak it, to be able to write it. In terms of religious identity, um, it is extremely polarised. Fully 90% of those who speak, um, who have some level of ability in Irish are Catholic, um, whereas only 7% is the case for um, Protestants. For Ulster Scots, 79% are Protestants and 17% are um, Catholic. If we look at linguistic identity and, and identification, or linguistic ability and identification, we see kind of a different story. And this is a really important part of this story, is that maybe on the census we have only 13% of Protestants say they speak Elsa Scots, but according to an omnibus study in, in 2010, um, I'm aware this isn't perfectly like with like, a census versus an omnibus study, but this is the best we can do at the minute. Um, a much higher percentage of Protestants uh, or proportion of Protestants actually identify um, as an Ulster Scot. Uh, on the other side, it's roughly the same number of Catholics who identify as Ulster Scots as those who speak it. And perhaps we can tentatively suggest that there's some kind of um, uh, relationship there. Perhaps linguistic ability is a good indicator of identification um, for Catholics, whereas this isn't the case um, for Protestants. There's, there's a step further than this that this, the census data doesn't um, doesn't pick up that that was very strong in my in my data and that is that there are a lot of people who identify with Ulster Scots but do not necessarily identify as an Ulster Scot. Many of the people I was interviewing, I asked them, "Do you identify as an Ulster Scot?" And the the most common answer was, "I've never really thought about it like that, but I identify with it." I'm not sure I identify as it. So there's, there's, there's an interesting kind of um, uh, differential going on there. For many of its promoters, ethnic identity and cultural practice have always been central to what the Ulster Scots movement is about. However, pursuing linguistic legitimacy was considered to be the most immediate and potentially fruitful tactic for gaining cultural and ethnic legitimacy. <coughs> Hence, since the promotion of the Ulster Scots language took centre stage in the 1990s and early 2000s, um, a, uh, uh, the, um, the, the linguistic part uh, took, a centre, took centre stage, whereas I think notions of identity and, and culture took, um, took a backstage and are only more recently coming out um, and switching around. Um, the, an information and communication um, outreach officer for the Ulster Scots Heritage Council um, put it like this. There have been many attempts to find cultural rights, but whenever they have done, they <coughs> find the language aspect much easier to define than the cultural. So what began as a process of cultural rights recognition with some cultural... Uh, sorry. So what began as a process of cultural rights recognition ended up language rights recognition with some cultural rights attached. As they examined the issue and tried to define it, it got reversed in what was the original intention. So we ended up with a model where to secure our cultural rights, we had to go heavy on the language rights. Since 1998, Ulster Scots has gained considerable ground. With the establishment of the um, Ulster Scots Agency, the movement became institutionalised, um, increasingly financed and increasingly legitimised. Um, and it has made considerable headway um, in a variety of areas of civil society. So thinking about my main argument, um, the point is this notion of ethnic dignity. So thinking about dignity. Dignity is quite an imprecise concept. 
it has been used by a range of writers and thinkers to mean a range of things. In general, it tends to point towards notions of respect and value for the person or people in question, and away from notions of shame, humiliation, and insult. However, as, me as many scholars have pointed out, the conceptual underpinnings, meanings, and consequences of the term are multifarious. For writers such as Schroeder, Rosen, and others, dignity can be arranged into um, four broad conceptualization. And I think, I think that Schroeder's, um, Schroeder's attempt is quite, is quite interesting, at least in terms of mapping uh, uh, Western discourses, um, Western philosophical and human rights discourses um, on dignity. So these four conceptualizations are Kantian, aristocratic, comportment, and um, meritorious. Um, the Kantian approach uh, conceives of dignity as something immutable. Um, char a characteristic, a basic characteristic of being human. So for Kant, all humans have some kind of inner worth, an absolute inner worth. And so we can see how this, um, this discourse became very useful for human rights um, uh, ideas. In aristocratic dignity, by contrast, um, dignity is associated with rank and value. In this conception, Individuals have dignity by nature of being positioned in the higher echelons of society. Um, so the, the dignity of being a king, the dignity of being a dignitary. Comportment dignity involves the individual acting in, cordon, in accordance with society's expect, expect, expectations of well-mannered demeanor and bearing. So dignity as being uh, something performed, um, acting with dignity. Um, meritorious dignity uh, incorporates the Aristotelian view wherein the individual has self-worth linked to the positioning or, or the possessing of deserved honours. This view considers dignity to be something which is merited by the individual rather than um, something which is just um, natural to them. So it is gaining in, in social respect. What this differentiation of um, of the use of the term dignity points to um, is, is basically its um, uh, lack of being a homogenous um, or, or clear uh, discourse. Um, but this is made even more heterogeneous by the anthropological tradition. In the anthropological tradition, especially in uh, literatures within post-conflict justice, um, dignity is something which is actually in reality uh, relative um, and very much shifting according to context. So this opens up the potential for there being a plethora understa of un understandings of dignity, but also a plethora of types of dignity. I think that this basically opens up the, the, set, the potential for certain types of dignity which are um, effective, which are, which are um, uh, beneficial, and other kinds of dignity which can be, can be less so. Usually when we're thinking of dignity, it is something fairly unproblematically positive. What I'm kind of interested in is where these discourses and narratives of dignity um, are kind of dubious, are problematic, um, or are precarious. However, a potentially productive definition of dignity, at least for what, um, what I'm trying to, um, trying to get to, um, comes from Marxist political economy and the sociology of work. Um, this is put quite well, I think, by a, a theorist, Randy Hodson. Um, so Hodson describes dignity as contingent not only in protecting oneself from abuse, but also on having personal space for one's individual identity. This was picked up, with, uh, picked up and run with by uh, Michelle Lamont. Um, and she, she works with, this, with Hodson's definition in her book, The Dignity of Working Men. So Lamont's definition is dignity as being as, as having autonomy for defining one's identity and protecting oneself from abuse. So from their work, I define the search for ethnic dignity as a desire to gain the autonomy over the peoplehood narrative through notions of ethnic identity. So using notions of genealogy, 
uh, uh, cultural tradition, linguistic specificity, folk revival, in order to gain a sense of, of collective identity. But, but to, in order to gain a, um, a level of autonomy over the story that we tell about um, our group. So essentially, um, oh, sorry. Yes, essentially, I contend that Ulster Scots is um, a, a means of attempting to, to achieve ethnic dignity. Uh, defining ethnic dignity as the search for the autonomy to define the peoplehood narr narrative to which the individual belongs, such that a group attempts to protect itself from potential humiliation and debasement. For historically dominant groups, humiliation or debasement often comes in the form of a host of actions understood as defeat, as lowering, or any grounds by which um, and that the, the historic position of dominance um, is, is reduced. For the once dominant, ethnicity can be a conduit through which defeatism can be turned into a dignified narrative of peoplehood. However, in doing so, it can often uh, evade historical wrongdoing, equivocate historical hist er, uh, equivocate uh, histories of domination, and produce quite troublesome um, outcomes. In order to understand the emergence of a discourse aiming to reclaim a sense of collective identity or collective dignity, we have to consider a sense of loss which gives rise to it. Humiliation can broadly be considered to involve a downward movement in the social standing of the individual or the people. As with dignity itself, indignity can also be understood in a plethora um, of ways. There are many reasons why feelings of collective humiliation, indignity and defeatism uh, might arise. For historically dominant groups, any downward movement in social standing can be interpreted as humiliation, as evidenced by, say, white men expressing anger at equality legislation. By the 1990s in Northern Ireland, a degree of defeatism amongst Protestants was um, palpable and widely remarked upon um, in the literature. While various descriptions and explanations for this sense of dignity, uh, for this sense of defeatism, have been offered, um, I find Andrew Finley's account um, particularly convincing. Finley points to three core causal mechanisms which give rise to Protestant defeatism. Firstly, he points to political economy. Oh, sorry. The Northeast had industrialized much earlier than the rest of Ireland, and by the time of partition had become a productive powerhouse. In the decades following the creation of Northern Ireland, the economic superiority of the North fueled a sense of Ulster exceptionalism with the Protestant working class at its base. However, by the end of the 20th century, the days of Protestant-centred industrialism had ended um, due to deindustrialization and the collapse of the heavy industry. So this, this, uh, this narrative is used by Finlay um, to describe why, um, at least give some, some, some causal mechanism for the rise of defeatism um, in the 1990s. A second issue is the decoupling of Northern Protestantism from progressive politics. So through the 20th century, many Northern Protestants associated themselves with um, progressiveness. However, by the end of the Troubles, the connection between Northern Protestantism um, and modernity and progress had been um, largely eroded. As Finley puts it, um, Protestant supremacism had a material basis in the uneven development of capitalism in Ireland and articulated ideas about modernity and progress that had a currency beyond Northern Ireland. By the same token, Protestant defeatism, in some degree, expresses a loss in confidence in progress and the, moder the, the, the modernist pro uh, project. A third point is identity politics. The rise of Ulster Scots is um, uh, perhaps most clearly associated from this on first, on first glance. <coughs> While identity talk was in the air in the 1970s, as Gilligan puts it, um, it was not until the cultural turn in the 1980s that it comes to the fore. The signing of the Anglo-Irish Agreement anchored 
the peace process in the two communities model, an interpretation of the conflict as being about a clash of cultural identities. Hence, as um, Finley puts it, to quote, quote Finley again, Northern Protestant defeatism can be seen not so much as the expression of, crisis, of a crisis in some pre-existing identity, but as symptomatic of the fact that Northern Protestants did not develop a strong collective identity and perhaps of ongoing attempts to get one in the context where identity politics have themselves become hegemonic. Ulster Scots, in articulating a sense of cultural identity, of language, of ancestry, um, which is both rooted in Ulster and in something other than Irish, offered a poss possible solution um, to this dynamic. To this, I would add one more potential causal mechanism um, for us to consider. Um, and this draw draws on uh, Jennifer Todd's work. Uh, in an article Jennifer Todd published um, in 1987, um, uh, she describes the Ulster loyalist mindset as being more than mere dominance. I think it's a, an interesting passage. She says that the ideological structure of Ulster loyalism is such that loyalists see dominance as the only means of preserving their identity. Not domination per se, but the meaning of domination to loyalists explains their practices. It is because the dominatory practices are perceived as the only alternative to humiliation that, they're fo that they are fought for to the last. I think Todd um, has some truth in it here, um, and that perhaps a sense of um, uh, humiliation, a loss um, in that sense of uh, domination, give rise to um, give rise to a sense of, of humiliation, humiliation um, and defeat. So, moving on to how I think Ulster Scots, at least some of the points that I would like to make about. How Ulster Scott um, tries to deal with these um, in the form of class, in the form of political ideology, in the form of identity politics, and in the form of colonial history, especially through its US uh, diaspora. So thinking about class, I argue that the Ulster Scott story of peoplehood deals directly with each of these aspects of Protestant defeatism um, in its attempt to reinstate a sense of group dignity. It deals with the economic and political factors by, by, this, by this discussion of class, of political economy, and through ideology. Specifically on class, it is, Ulster Scots is cobbled together from various different features from a variety of sources. So in terms of language, in terms of grammar, um, it is largely based off um, rural speech patterns. It is largely the rural agricultural worker. Um, Ulster Scots culture, in contrast, is a collage of Protestant working class culture, um, uh, aspects of Northern Irish folk culture, as practiced by historical um, uh, historical working class groups, um, especially when we're thinking about the the, um, the investigation of folk culture. Often, it is the peasantry and the proletariat who are seen as the holders of folk culture. Um, but Ulster Scots also includes um, elements of Scottish national practices. Um, interest in the promotion of Ulster Scots as a language has largely been rejected by working class unionists and loyalists in Belfast. Um, McCall's research in 2002 pointed, um, uh, pointed this out that this was, this was a widely held belief. It was widely held that Ulster Scots language as a language movement was uh, a middle class preserve, that it was for, um, and I quote, um, those from a Christian intellectual background. A second dimension of alienation um, here, though, is uh, a urban-rural divide. Um, and again, I quote uh, McCall, urban dwellers in Belfast have a disparaging attitude towards the Ulster Scots language slash cant, precisely because it is perceived as being from backward rural areas and not the progressive city. But due to a variety of, of um, institutional, political, and economic factors, which if you are interested, you can read about in my article, um, Ethnic, Monopoly, uh, Ethnic Monopoly, which is published in Irish Journal of Sociology. Sorry for the, the shameless plug. Um, a single group has developed um, essentially a monopoly over setting the official narrative about Ulster Scots um, since the 1998 agreement. And that's the, the, good, the, the Ulster Scots agency. 
Um, this official version of Ulster Scots um, appropriates urban and rural class working fa class features into a respectable working class folk ethnic peoplehood story. This is a repackaging of um, disparate working class features into basically a, a middle class um, identity. This official version adopts also a dignity, what I would term a dignity of working men narrative, where the Ulster Scots uh, come to be associated with industriousness without privilege, this kind of vision of a virtuous, respectable working class. So in this narrative, Ulster Scots come from a lowly and humble background. They are hardworking, pull yourself up by the bootstraps types. They come from outside the realm of privilege, very definitely. Every penny they've worked for, they, er they earn and deserved. Um, and as a discourse, it places them very much outside the bounds of historical um, power. So as you can see, this is quite a, quite a shift in, from the, 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 the Protestant settler colonial tri triumphalist uh, narrative, um, which was common in the 20th century, especially if you, as you'd see in the work of um, Pamela Clayton. To give one quote from my data to back this up, um, one of my interviewees at a, uh, at a primary school um, say, said this, Ulster Scott is, it's the working class man. And I don't think it's the lower working class, it's not the elite aristocracy who are going to promote Ulster Scots. It's the average working, uh, hard working people who are the backbone of society. They're the people who'd gone to the First World War and were basically wiped out. Literally, literally a generation of them were Ulster Scots and the memorials are all over the planet. I see Ulster Scots as belonging not to the aristocracy, but to the common working man. It's his culture. Something you might note here is that this has a distinct gender dimension to it. Um, I don't have the time to discuss it today, um, but I, I do address this, um, this issue in, in my book. I want to give you one more quote, just because I think it's interesting, um, and this is about the association between Ulster Scots as a language and class. Um, and this is from a education officer at the Ulster Scots Agency. At primary school, I learned opposite, O-P-P-O-I-S-I-T-E. I'm never going to use that word in a million years. It was alien in my tongue. You're sitting for nance me. At him, where's the salt at? It's sitting for nance you, you know. I learned how to spell also and the three twos, T-O, T-O-O, T-double-O, but I would never use T-double-O. -O. It's for by you use in everyday speech. I would never think of saying two or also. And if I'd have said that in my granny's house, she would have said, what are you on about? Who do you think you are also opposite? I just thought this was interesting because it's very definitely connecting Ulster Scots um, linguistically to, um, to a, a certain class discourse. So moving on to ideology, and I don't have, uh, I don't want to spend too much time on, on ideology because I don't have time to, to flesh it out in, in very much detail. But on ideology, there is some return of the notion of tying Protestantism to progressive politics. Drawing on a notional ethnic connection to the Scottish Enlightenment, the Ulster Scots are depicted as primary drivers of liberal pro progress especially the emergence of liberal democracy and formal education on both sides of the Atlantic. Quite, quite interestingly, I think, the connections between the Ulster Scots and the Scottish Enlightenment via some kind of pseudo-biological spirit of the people, um, kind of a, a, an Ulster Scots vo Volksgeist, um, was pretty solidly inimical to the spirit of the Enlightenment, chiming much more actually with the anti-Enlightenment romantic movement. Um, but but, but that, that aside, um, more prominent than the return of, pro, of progressive politics is this narrative which I would call ethnic neoliberalism. So especially through the lens of their US diaspora, which, uh, which I will get to, the US are viewed as the primary creators of the free market, of n the night watchman state, um, even verging on libertarian principles at times. Not only is it suggested, well, it's suggested in the data that there is um, that such a political system, a kind of um, a free market system, 
um, is basically the conditions under which Ulster Scots best thrive, but that these ideas are themselves conceptualised as products of the ethnic idiosyncrasies of the Ulster Scots themselves. In other words, the Ulster Scots are not only predisposed towards these political structures, but that these ideas emerged in the world as a result of this group and its, and its actions. It's almost as if these ideologies were in their blood. There is much more that we could discuss here. However, uh, I, I don't have time to, to, to tease it out uh, more. But one, one more shameless plug, if I may. Um, you can read more about this in, in another paper, uh, Diaspora, Dig De Defeatism and Dignity, um, published in Ethnic and, and Racial Studies. So moving on to think a little bit more about um, identity politics. Ulster Scots is often presented as being a sort of Protestant answer to Irish and Irishness. Um, an idea that Catholics have their culture and in their language, why can't we have ours? Um, a more cynical way of putting that is um, the notion of Ulster Scots as a cultural weapon, as a means of re, uh, restricting release of funds to Irish. Basically, the argument is then, if, if we need parity of esteem, then you would need to double the budget for Irish to be sustained, um, uh, the, the budget for Irish for both to receive um, funding. Or you'd have to split the, the budget for cultural stuff in half between Scot uh, Ulster Scots and Irish. Mac Pauline argues that Ulster Scots is best understood basically as a cultural weapon um, and as a form of cultural victimhood. However, although this um, cynical view of Ulster Scots is, um, is um, very commonly found, and if you Google Ulster Scots, um, you may well come across this discourse, I don't believe that this is, um, is particularly the case, at least not in its entirety. There may be some who use Ulster Scots um, as a weapon, um, but from those I interviewed, this didn't seem to be... Um, uh, uh, the way that they, they saw the usefulness of Ulster Scots. Um, uh, and this, this narrative didn't connect um, uh, as much as um, uh, you would expect if you're coming from this, this angle. I would contend that Ulster Scots is primarily not constructed in order to compete with Irishness or even to position itself against Irishness. And in fact, again and again and again in my interviews, this was, um, this was reiterated that, that the aim is not to compete with Irish. Um, and I think that that, that is um, actually accurate. Rather, I would argue that it is uh, it's more mim mimetic. Um, and I mean mimetic in the mimetic desire style um, a la René Girard. Um, the desire is not to compete with Irishness. The, the, the desire is not to be against Irish, uh, Irishness. The desire is actually, I think, to have what something of what Irishness has. The desire is for a legitimate ethno-cultural heritage, um, or for m more than that, really. The desire is for the sense of group dignity which accompany, accompanies legitimate um, ethno-cultural heritage. Um, so allow me to, to, to flesh this out a little, bit, a little bit more. Throughout the data, there is a repeated, consistent um, insistence upon the distancing of Ulster Scots from political Protestantism, from Ulster loyalist um, uh, unionist, um, uh, 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 from, from unionist and loyalist symbolism. And for many of my interviewees, actually, there was a desire to distance Ulster Scots from senses of Britishness, from unionism, and even any kind of defense of the union um, itself. In terms of the Ulster Scots narrative of history, traditionally unionist and loyalist moments in history are um, sidelined, while those actually associated with Irish um, story of peoplehood, um, such as the history of British imperialism, um, especially English imperialism, um, uh, United, the United Irish uh, Irishman Rebellion, uh, the notion of a US diaspora, these things take central, central stage. In particular, uh, the reversed, uh, the, the revised Ulster Scots history of the United Irishman clearly demonstrates a desire for Protestants to have the dignity of being 
history's freedom fighters in Ireland. Uh, the, the narrative is of Ulster Scots fighting with the Irish against the British imperial ruling class. And this theme comes up um, again and again. So, the feeling that Protestants wanted um, the legitimacy of that, that Irishness has was clear through my data. So I want to give you a couple of quotes to, get, to, get, to give a kind of feeling of, of this. This is from a teacher in, a, in um, an Ulster Scots flagship award school. When I went into Mintian primary schools, I noticed how much of a sense of pride in their Irish identity, Irish national identity there was. One of the things I make sure of um, is whenever you walk through the doors of Bally Levert, obviously a, a pseudonym school, you're greeted in Ulster Scots. Another teacher. I think especially if you're from a Protestant origin, they struggle to find their identity, whereas the Irish identity is very strong and very, you know, it's an identified culture. You know what I mean? You've got your language, you've got your music, you've got your dance, you've got your tradition, it's all there. Whereas I think, I suppose maybe for an Ulster, Ulster Protestant or Ulster Presbyterians or whatever else, it's trying to find an identity. And in many ways, they maybe see that within their Ulster Scots heritage. Another teacher. The reasons for introducing Ulster Scots into the school was being conscious that this community would be very loyal in its view. And I mean loyal in a positive word, way rather than loyalist. I felt that this was one aspect of their culture that wasn't being explored. My personal belief is very much that there is, rightly, a very strong Gaelic culture. And that's right and proper that that be recognised, but certainly as I was growing up in East Belfast, my sense of who I was and sense of belonging was always kind of shunned. It wasn't recognised, it wasn't legitimised. It was as though it was, there was something a bit shady about it, as in you people are only just here. To sum up this section, I argue that this is illustrative of a desire to reinstate a sense of dignity via an ethnic narrative. In this sense, Ulster Scots is not simply an identity to fulfil an identity deficit, but a pro product of the mimetic desire for the dignity of having a legitimate cultural identity, and particularly one which has the dignity of sorts, of being the, culturally, the, the historically dominated rather than the historically dominating. This is also reiterated in the, co the colonial narrative. The notion of a US diaspora is something of an obsession to promoters of the Ulster Scots. In his description of his frustration with the direction Ulster Scots had taken in recent years, the performer and TV personality, Willie Drennan, sarcastically remarked uh, according to, uh, that according to the Ulster Scots agency, it is as if we've invented the world and certainly invented America, that's for sure. So let me put that quote in, in context. According to my interview data, as well and as well my, my analysis of the Ulster Scots educational materials for use in schools, the Ulster Scots are interpreted as being the primary drivers of US history. It's claimed that, in many cases, the Ulster Scots were the first settlers in the American colonies. By the time the newcomers arrived on the US soil in later centuries, such as the Irish in the 19th century, the Ulster Scots were simply the Americans. Hence, the culture, value, and po values and politics of the US is really Ulster Scots values, culture, um, uh, uh, and politics. And this very much fits in with the political economic ideology as well. The American Revolution was in truth a war between freedom-loving Ulster Scots who had fled pre uh, Presbyterian persecution under Anglican-centric imperial rule. A return of English imposition uh, had made these fighting Ulster Scots once again revolt. The Declaration of Independence no taxation without representation, the Western expansion, the Battle of the Alamo, all seen as Ulster Scots undertakings primarily. William Clark of the Lewis and Clark expedition in the westward, westward expansion, Davy Crockett, General Sam Houston, and no less than 13 presidents are declared as being great Scotch-Irish Americans. So I want to give a few more quotes on this. <clears throat> 
So this is in the booklets for teaching in, in primary schools. The Scotch-Irish were, were in many cases the first non-Native Americans. Once they moved inland from the already settled coastal towns into the Appalachian foothills, they set up their own townlands and homes and established the lifestyle for this new land. As the first Americans, they were totally assimilated into the fabric of the nation and their principles and virtues are deeply embedded in the Constitution of the United States. For this reason, it is much harder to trace Americans from Ulster Scots backgrounds than the later <laughs> Irish emigrants or those from other ethnic groups. The Scotch-Irish were the Americans by the time these later arrivals came to this new land. I think what's kind of interesting about this is that it flips the Northern Irish narrative, where the original inhabitants are the Irish and Scottish settlers come along and they're the new settlers to the, to the land. In this narrative, it's flipped. The Ulster Scots were kind of almost the first and then, and then the Irish um, come in later. A couple more quotes from these booklets, um, three different booklets. Um, the Ulster Scots' main contributions to the development of America were their fighting spirit, which helped to open up the land, their main religion, Presbyterianism, which uh, led to church planting, and their democratic spirit, which put them in the vanguard of the American War of Independence. The first voice publicly raised in America to dissolve all connection with Great Britain came not from the Puritans of New England or the Dutch of New York or the planters of Virginia, but the Scotch-Irish Presbyterians. Um, and this is a quote from, from Basil McRae. Um, the core of what the Americans think of as being the American ideals are actually pretty close to Ulster Presbyterianism, which is about the state won't interfere, I'll do my thing, my right to hold arms, my rights, you know. All these things, whether right or wrong, were an encapsulation of what the freedom-seeking Ulster Scots thought up as themselves. Ulster Scots is about individualism, it's about self-reliance, independence of mind and action. And these ideas are echoed throughout um, the data. Um, one more quote from, um, from Mike Nesbitt. For me, the real strength of Ulster Scott, the Ulster Scots tradition is in its people, not a language. So claims that up to 17 American presidents have Ulster Scots connection, that's over 40%. For Northern Ireland, which is the postage stamp, to produce that many presidents, whereas France, for example, has no lineage connection, is mighty. American generals, the people, it's just awesome. And what they did in terms of shaping America, you, you need only to read Jim Webb's book, Born Fighting, to see how they have influenced the whole kind of cultural thinking in the United States. As that last quote points um, to, there's been something of a mutual interaction between Northern Ireland and the US in the rise of the Ulster Scots identity. In the US, there has been a surge of interest in Scotch-Irish identity. Um, in popular books such as Born Fighting by Jim Webb, as, um, as quoted, but also a, a more recent publication, Hillbilly Elegy by J.D. Vance. Promoters of Ulster Scots here in Northern Ireland have taken up ideas from these publications, while US writers have been reinforced by the notion of an ongoing Ulster Scots um, uh, revival with uh, annually increasing legitimacy in the diaspora homeland. Although the assumption that what is meant by Scotch-Irish in the US um, is meant to mean the same thing as Ulster Scots in Northern Ireland is actually pretty dubious to say the least. Often in the US, the notion of being Scotch-Irish is understood to be to by, by the people themselves to mean being from the British Isles, but not being from England or Wales. But the fact that this hyphenated American identity has existed for much longer than, um, than Ulster Scots has as a public idea, public identity, um, gives um, Ulster Scots here even more um, of a sense of legitima legitimacy as an identity. I argue that the US diaspora offers several important things to the Ulster Scots narrative. It offers a space in which settler colonialism may be, may be discussed, and discussed, if not unproblematically, much, much less so than in Northern Ireland. It's another land in which uh, there being settler colonialists may be glorious again, 
it offers the ability to develop a claim of being almost the original inhabit inhabitants, like we saw, um, with this later influx of Irish settlers coming in. It is an arena where there is a long-standing um, conceptual difference between being Irish and being Scotch-Irish. It offers a glorious past, this kind of idea of being um, uh, tectonic on the world stage. All the presidents, the world-changing events, the, the key uh, movers and shakers in, these, in the American Revolution, the, the, um, uh, the rise of um, American democracy. And also, the US context is a space in which the Scotch-Irish are interpreted as revolutionaries rather than reactionaries. They are anti-imperialists. Uh, they are the engaged and indignant uh, working class who are fighting against um, English rule, English, um, the English ruling class. So far from the defeatism of the late 20th century, the Ulster Scots narrative is a glorious narrative. In the US context, the, US are, the, the Ulster Scots are free to celebrate um, uh, their settlerism, repositioned as being outside the bounds of colonial domination. They are humble yet determined travellers whose belligerence or thoranness uh, may have got them into the odd spot of trouble along the way, but overall it's been their source of their exceptionalism. So clearly this narrative holds considerable capacity for reinstating the notion of, of group dignity. However, in order to do so, I would argue that Ulster Scots um, actually obviates and obscures rather than deals with um, the troublesome history um, uh, of, of Northern Ireland. So con to conclude and to go back to my, my title, uh, the title for this talk, I would conclude that Ulster Scots is a form of problematic catharsis. So catharsis is a means of expressing oneself such that um, psychological relief is provided via the open expression of deeply held but unspoken affect. However, it's not necessarily about truth-telling. We often think of a cathartic moment as being a, a, a moment of truth. Um, it, but it doesn't necessarily have to be like that. It doesn't necessarily take the individual in the direction of truth and uh, reconciliation. Ulster Scots often is more of a regressive form of catharsis. It's an attempt to deal with a very real problem of, um, of a feeling of defeatism, but it does so often by, by obscuring rather than bringing to light and dealing with um, the problematic histories of Protestantism um, in Northern Ireland. Furthermore, such uh, such notions of peoplehood difference has the has quite considerable potential for uh, bifurcating um, a further bifurcation of Northern Irish society by grounding quite deeply held notions of communal difference within biological genealogical rationales. Um, I think that that, that, that this, there's an element of um, of greater de to depth to that. Um, with that, I I, I will conclude. Uh, but I'm very interested to hear any of your comments or questions that you might have. Thank you.